I V M. We would like to thank Storytel for sponsoring this show. Storytel is an audiobook platform that lets you hear hundreds of thousands of stories on your mobile, on your PC, wherever you prefer. You can get a great deal by signing up at storytel.com slash IVM. But before I tell you what the deal is, let me make a recommendation for you for your first book. When you go to Storytel, search for James Clavell. He has a number of books, but I'm going to recommend Shogun to you. Shogun is the story of an Englishman who's shipwrecked in 16th century Japan and how he struggles to deal with the culture, gets embroiled in the politics of the land. It's a great story. And if it wasn't enough that you can get just this one book, James Clavell's Asian Saga has five more books on Storytel. So go to Storytel.com slash IVM. You can get your first month at 99 rupees a month instead of 299. That's 200 rupees off on your first month. Storytel.com slash IVM. Go check it out. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast by the Takshashila Institution. We are a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like bringing fresh perspectives to Indian affairs and Indian perspectives to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello, welcome to another episode of All Things Policy. Today we are joined by our in-house economist, Sarthak, and uh, we have an interesting thing to talk to uh, uh, our listeners today. This is about something which we see all around, and this is the newest fashion trend that we are seeing every day. I think you have a sense of what we're talking about by now. It's the face mask. It's impossible to see the neon colors, the beautiful elephants and the varieties of flowers on everyone's faces. And things weren't the same as they are today. There was a time when face masks had a lot of uh, information, uh, which was uh, wrongly given to uh, us by WHO. People weren't sure if they should be wearing it. If they want to wear it, where do they buy one? And things were, uh, let's just say, a big mess. So it's interesting to see how things have changed from then to now. And... It's interesting that because it doesn't look like there's only one person or one agency which has fixed this problem. So today, let's just dive in to understand what is it has got us from there to over here. So Sarkak, what what is it? Why do you think the scarcity and this uh, difficulty in access of face masks, the increase in prices is not like the way it was when the lockdown started around in March of 2020? Yeah. So, hi, Saurav. Uh, thanks for having me here. So, I remember uh, before the lockdown started uh, in the month, early part of March, I had to travel. Uh, I mean, I had to take a flight for, I mean, there was some emergency. I had to take a flight. So, at that point of time, I was uh, looking for masks and I found it so difficult to get masks back then. And again, I did not have a very good idea. I just had heard that uh, N95 masks are the best kind of mask or at least they provide the best kind of protection. At least that's what I knew. I didn't know about N99 or other things. So at that point of time, I was just uh, trying to find out these masks. I could not. And at the last moment, I had the flight maybe at uh, night around 9 p.m. Uh, so around 3 or 4 p.m., I came across a store which had hoarded some of these N95 masks, 3M N95 masks, and they were selling it at like double or triple the MRP. I didn't have any option. I had to purchase that. Cut to December uh, 2020. And now again, I had to take a flight. Again, uh, there was some kind of emergency. So I had to take a flight. But now there is a complete change. Just you go to Amazon, you will find variety of masks. Go to your local store, there will be variety of masks. And again, uh, you will have N95, you will have... uh, uh, the cloth masks, and again, within that also, different kind of designs. Not only masks, uh, face shields and all these things have come up. I mean, it's kind of interesting to see how certain things which were not available uh, before March or before February, in 2019, you would not have even thought about all of, all of these things, how, uh, how they're so easily available, how the quality, quantity, everything has changed so drastically. So what I would, I mean, this is, Paul, this is an exact example or this is the right case for us to understand how markets operate. So as the pandemic struck different parts of the world, and again, India also uh, got exposed to the pandemic uh, from January onwards, uh, we started having different kind of cases. The number of cases started slowly increasing in February. And again, we know what happened in March, right? Uh, so 
the demand for masks would have increased drastically. And again, here, uh, a different kind of mask will be required. Uh, those who would have been at the front line, those who have been working in the hospitals, they would, I mean, for them, the risk uh, of exposure would have been much higher, right? So they would require certain kind of masks like the N95 mask or surgical mask, all those kind of things. And others who might not, I mean, others might not have that kind of risk. Uh, for them, again, maybe cloth masks also do. So, the demand is suddenly increasing at that point of time. And uh, the supply chains, okay, the sub, there were different kind of constraints over there. For example, for manufacturing N95 masks, you require certain kind of uh, fiber, which was not available in India. Very few manufacturers in India were uh, making these kind of masks. And again, we were heavily dependent on countries like China for the raw material that is used for manufacturing N95 masks. And again, uh, not many players were doing it. There were not many players were importing it from China and manufacturing it over here. And again, in China also, you had the same problem, right? They also, uh, I mean, the factories were shut down. And again, whatever production was going on at that point of time, it was meeting the domestic requirements over there. So all these challenges were there. But over a period of time, as the demand increased, the incentives for uh, different players uh, to manufacture these masks would have increased. And now we see so many firms which have come up and who, which have uh, which, which are not manufacturing masks, but now they are manufacturing masks. In fact, there was one estimate that uh, this entire mask industry will be worth around 10,000 to 12,000 crores in India. That was the estimate. Just imagine 10,000 to 12,000 crores. And again, a large chunk of that is going to be fashion masks. Small chunk will be the surgical or the N95 mask. Large chunk is going to be the fashion mask. The examples that we are saying, right? Uh, the different kind of prints you see on masks right now. And many of these established firms, for example, Aditya Billa, uh, Fashion, uh, Raymond's, they have also pitched in. Though there are different kind of restrictions on marriages right now, but you might have a friend or so, a friend or relative who is getting married and you would have seen how people are uh, sporting uh, those kind of masks, which is just going along with their marriage attires. So what I would say is, as the demand increased, uh, more people were willing to purchase masks, more people were willing to pay more for the masks. And this is creating incentives for different kind of suppliers. And the suppliers are pitching in, uh, again, the suppliers might have ramped up their own production capacity, what they have. In some cases, they might have set up their own units. Uh, in other instances, uh, some local players, they might have also come up. You have also examples of cooperatives doing this. Uh, women who were work, I mean, within their own homes, they were working as uh, household help or uh, those kind of professions. They have also started stitching masks. So now all of a sudden, you have good supply of masks. So much so that around June, uh, we had already, we, we already had a surplus of masks. And again, we had started exporting masks or there were some demands for, ex for uh, initiating the export of masks for India. Right. That's a fascinating tale uh, of how markets have responded and, that, and so quickly. I think the turnaround time would be less than say 15, 20 days. Right. In March, we were struggling. And suddenly in uh, April and uh, May, we had a variety of masks being given away. The interesting thing is that the reason for this is that we let people innovate freely. Right? There was no one telling people that, listen, we don't have masks available. Uh, the government didn't uh, give us a supreme order that, listen, uh, we have a scarcity of masks. Uh, can someone please step in and produce them? They didn't go to the Bidlas or the Reliance to say that, listen, their industries need to now stop everything and do produce masks. So... How is it that people found out and understood what is the mechanism in very elementary terms that made people respond and take up to this innovation? And I think prices have a very interesting role to play here. Like you said in your story, you ended up going to the store and you found that the price of the mask was three times the price that you would usually pay. Right? And, yes, uh, exactly. This price signal or this price information is the reason why people took up innovating masks. Because they probably saw that, look, it looks like there's money to be made here. People do not have masks and the prices are high. If we walk in at this moment, produce these masks and sell it at, at that high markup, maybe we make a profit and it will pay for getting into this industry without any know-how and spending that capital in getting the machinery, the equipment and the labor right to take, make it happen. It's a fascinating tale of how uh, the markets responded. But I think at the same time, yeah. uh, the government wasn't so sure if uh, they would want that ha to happen. And interestingly, on March 20th, 
uh, Ram Vilas Paswan from the Union government uh, had an interesting announcement, and he said that the uh, the masks would be under the Essential Commodities Act, and the prices of the fabrics that they'll use for the two ply and the three ply surgical masks will remain same as it was on February 12th, while the retail price of the three ply masks will be at rupees eight per mask and not exceed rupees ten. Do you see, Sartak, how with fine tuning they are telling us how much prices there would be, why there would be a price gap? So, what do you think? Is that the right thing to do for the government to step in here and tell people that look, you can make a mask, but only at this price and nothing else? See, we have all we have seen, we have empirical evidence, we have historical evidence that price caps don't work. I mean, if you put, uh, if you have these price caps, right? So at the end, what happens is there is some deadweight loss. There will always be loss in efficiency. Whenever you have price caps, the right signals that you talked about, okay, that does not go to the manufacturers. Uh, If you put a price cap, that means what will happen is there is more demand. Okay. And uh, the supply will always be less because the suppliers, the manufacturers, they are not getting the right kind of incentives. So it always leads to shortage. But I think over a period of time, all these price caps were relaxed. Initial few, uh, I mean, few months or so, these price caps were there. But over a period of time, all these price caps were relaxed. And as a result of, as a result of which, the price mechanisms worked perfectly fine. I remember there were some state governments also which did the same. Uh, they had put different kind of price caps on N95 masks. And the price caps were such that uh, the suppliers who had all, who already had stocks of masks with them, they were not willing to sell it because they knew that they are going to get much more uh, if they are going to sell it in the market. People are willing to pay more for it. And again, in some cases, the price caps were such that it, they would have entered in, they would have ended in losses. They would have procured these masks from somewhere else. Uh, the, the, the cost of procurement, the cost, whatever price they have paid for purchasing it, it was much more than that. So what they did was they started holding it. They kept it like that. So in that case, what is the unintended consequence? The entire idea of have using this of, of people using this mask is how you can prevent the pandemic from spreading. But if people are not selling it because they are not getting the right incentives, they will be making a loss. So again, the entire purpose is not met. The disease will spread. The, our health workers will not be protected. Our frontline workers will not be protected. This went on for some period of time, and eventually, all these things were relaxed. And yeah, and. And we see how things have panned out after that. And when I heard from you, I just could not refrain from thinking about onions. I'm sorry, but my first thought in my mind was, okay, but this is exactly how things happen in the onion industry, right? Or when onions, uh, we see a cyclical shoot up of prices and where a lot of farmers and uh, sellers are not willing to sell their onions because the government has put a price cap, because the government has put that restriction that you may not sell it for more than this particular price. And that holding is taking place. And it's interesting to see that how uh, we have a natural experiment here, right, of such that we know if we let the markets do their function, we'll have interesting uh, outputs and we may not have the same constraints as they would otherwise. So it's, it's a fascinating tale of how the mask industry evolved. But at the same time, I also want to talk about the other important thing that has really helped us save ourselves in the pandemic, which is hand sanitizers. Right. We saw a similar uh, trend in the hand sanitizer industry where there weren't any hand sanitizers and then we got plenty of them and now we get various scents. Right? I don't know what is your favorite scent, but I have settled for, uh, I think, Mogra. I found a nice, interesting Mogra hand sanitizer. But it's just fascinating. But at the same time, I'm a little worried because uh, when the pandemic started, we weren't sure about every hand sanitizer. Right? There was a water-based hand sanitizer it was an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Even alcohol had a certain amount. Some people would say that, look, you have to rub your hands with 80% alcohol sanitizer. Some said 70%. And even to this day, right, a lot of people say that, look, the best you can do is wash your hands with soap because hand sanitizer is just killing your hands. Right? It's not good for you. It's not going to be nice. And uh, I'm just worried. How do we really come to know that the particular person who is manufacturing this chemical composition, right, At the end of the day, it is a chemical composition that we are rubbing on our hands. It's good for us. It's safe for us. It is something which we can wash and clean our hands with and maybe even consume our meal. So how do we know, right, which is the right quality of hand sanitizer and it's good enough to be used? See, uh, 
how this entire i mean the how the hand sanitizer market has performed how it has uh, met different demands we need to look at that as well uh, see uh, as the pandemic uh, stuck india again different firms organizations all of them started to take different precautions within our own households also we started to take different kind of precautions and yeah soaps and all are fine but at the same time we have to see whether we can use the soaps everywhere right you don't have access to potable water everywhere so that is the reason uh, the demand for sanitizers increased drastically if you are using public transport you might you have had to use it if you are entering into an office you have to use it in fact if someone is coming to your house most likely you will be putting a you will be having a, a hand sanitizer uh, dispenser uh, at the entrance or at, at the at your door so the demand for hand sanitizers uh, increased uh, drastically and uh, how do you meet that demand that was the question so here you are trying the here we try to balance that out on one side there is a massive demand because of the pandemic uh, and on the other hand you are trying to i mean you also have to look at the safety concerns and all these things but if you look at it manufacturing hand sanitizers is not something which is very very difficult in fact some of the countries for example thailand uh, their health authorities it's themselves they what they did was they gave instructions to people that uh, this is what you have to do to manufacture hand sanitizers and you are on your own so they had these uh, diy instructions do it yourself instructions uh, to manufacture hand sanitizers then uh, countries like us what they did was generally they also have these licensing mechanisms and all these things uh, but for dealing with the pandemic what they did was again they came up with some instructions and they said that whoever wants to manufacture sanitizers they can do it only thing they have to do is there's a particular website just go over there and put in your details that you are going to manufacture hand sanitizers and you have to put your address and all these things and whatever your manufacturing right they will be most likely in a bottle or something so there you have to put your details address details and all these things and there has to be a helpline number in case something goes wrong people will should be able to report that so it's it has been more of a self regulation thing and again the role of government has been limited initially uh, there were these in case of india initially you had to give licenses there were there was strict mechanism to provide licenses but over a period of time all these things have been relaxed uh, for example typically what happens is if you have to manufacture sanitizers then central authorities as well as state authorities both will come and inspect your setup takes it usually takes time but again since you are dealing with a certain kind of circum situation where time is very important you cannot delay things right so you have to somewhere balance that then that is what happened and as a result of which our production has increased massively uh, there are some estimates which say that uh, it has grown by around uh, 20 to 30 times the sanitizer sanitizer category is going to in fact there is an estimate that sanitizer category will increase to 20 to 30 times some esti some estimates say that it has grown at a rate of 10 times of what it was last year uh, but how do i visualize this i mean as you are going at a very fast rate uh, and many unorganized players also enter into the sector there are chances of these kind of things happening whatever uh, i mean 70% of alcohol or 75% of alcohol these things could have been floated there were some studies which found out that they say the the particular brand was saying that they have some 75% alcohol but it was having just 10% alcohol this is a typical case of i would say it's an example of information asymmetry where the manufacturer knows uh, manufacturer has that strategic information what kind of product composition it is the consumer doesn't have it so you have to find out ways of how to resolve it since nowadays we have already reached that capacity we are uh, we are we are most likely producing more than that is required now you have to find out ways by which this information asymmetry can be reduced and uh, over a period of time what has happened is the large manufacturers the big manufacturers they have come into the picture now they are producing so most likely all these issues that we had seen in the initial phase might go down because these are all reputed manufacturers they they, they know that if people come to know that these, these are the things which are happening in that If, if there is some independent study which finds out that this is uh, this particular company, let's say a Godrej or a Hindustan Unilever has done this, then their will reputation will be at stake. So in that scenario, I mean, as more and more large organized players enter into the sector, I would assume all these things will be resolved. And again. within the industry itself maybe they will come up with some standards or they will say that okay we are adhering to these standards that way they will also be uh, signaling the consumers that their product is uh, safer as compared to the other products maybe those kind of things will happen and uh, that is something which can probably resolve this but yeah in the beginning it was uh, that particular thing right uh, you have to there was this fight there was this uh, conflict between uh, efficiency 
or end effectiveness. That is what we had seen. Right. I think another way that market resolves this is uh, five star ratings. Right. I mean, uh, Amazon itself has this greatest feature of figuring out who is the wrong manufacturer and who isn't. So if I had, I, uh, I remember when I had to buy sanitizers, I may not have done as much research on anything else as much on reading every review, seeing how many stars it had got, reading particular comments. And it seemed like that alone is a, a fantastic way to regulate misinformation. Right? So if a seller is uh, coming by on Amazon, which uh, any person would want to come by because their money is to be made when you enter the marketplace and being listed on Amazon is ensures that you will get guaranteed amount of consumer base. And if you realize that you get a bad rating there, or if you get a bad review, you are in for trouble. And it's likely that you, no one would buy your product. It's likely that Amazon will chuck you out of this marketplace or there may be other constraints. So we may not even need to uh, wait for uh, larger players to come down in the industry and increase the standards. The consumers themselves are giving away this feedback in a very organized way of what works, what does not work. But yeah, uh, it's only, I mean, I, I think this solution will be applicable only when you're purchasing online, right? So uh, it also has its uh, limitations, but yeah, it's it's a good way. I mean, this is the way by which uh, uh, people, can, consumers can get an idea which is working, which is not working. Right. So I think uh, there are some lessons to be extrapolated from uh, our, uh, uh, how we witnessing the hand sanitizers and the face mask industry evolve. But before we get to that, I have a very simple question and uh, this has baffled me all the time. So the government has come up and uh, this is a historic uh, act, which we call the Essential Commodities Act. I'm guessing it's nothing but a big list of things that the government will control and put a price cap on and will tell people what to do, what not to produce, etc, etc. Just generally, I want to know what is your thought on the act, the Essential Commodity Act and is the government doing the right thing by creating such an act? Is it doing the right thing by putting it in the list? Or the government should be more trusting of people and markets in turning out to resolve scarcity and uh, uh, bottlenecks as and when they emerge. See, what happens under the Essential Commodities Act? See, under this particular law, the government decides what are those things which are essential for the people. And accordingly, it devises way by which it thinks people will be able to have access to these kind of goods. Right? For example, under Essential Commodities Act, there are different provisions by which uh, certain drugs, okay, which the government feels is essential, the price of these drugs can be uh, capped. Okay, It can uh, cap the price of these drugs and it also has, uh, I mean, again, under that, there are different kind of monitoring mechanisms. For example, you have the, uh, the, the there is this uh, body which monitors the prices of drugs. So, under the Essential Commodities Act, what will happen is certain uh, drugs will be decided. Okay, the, the price of these drugs cannot be beyond this particular limit. So those kind of things happens. And again, it does not only uh, limit itself to drugs. Other things can also be included. Now, generally, what happens here is if the government decides that these are the drugs which are essential and its price needs to be capped, what happens is the manufacturers will not typically have incentives to manufacture these kind of drugs. That's the drugs which have been uh, considered essential by the government. And as a result of which, they will find out different ways uh, to either trespass these guidelines. So let's say the government decides that 25 milligram of X drug needs to be priced at this. So what, what they will do, they will try to trespass it. They will find out some ways by which, I mean, they will not manufacture 25 milligram of that particular drug or they will uh, manufacture some other dosage or something. They will try to find out ways uh, around it. Or in the worst situation, what they will do, they will start manufacturing drugs which are not under the essential categories. They will manufacture something else. So as a result of which, what will happen? Those drugs which were considered to be essential by the government, they will be in short supply. I mean, there are different studies which point out the same thing. The same thing applies for uh, for, for a different kind of devices, medical devices, which have been put under the list. So again, the good, uh, good the manufacturers will, uh, those who were getting some sort of, those, those who had the incentive to manufacture these things, they will move to manufacturing something else, which is not under the price cap. And as a result of all these things, what happens? Only those manufacturers, the cheap manufacturers, the manufacturers who probably did not adhere to particular quality standards, uh, who could manufacture things at a very cheaper price, uh, they are the ones who will remain in the market. As a result of which, the quality of drugs, quality of medical devices, the quality of other things, it suffers. So eventually the aim is to ensure that people 
should have access to this people's health outcomes people's other outcomes will improve but that doesn't happen so this is something that i uh, i mean this is a major unintended consequence of uh, putting of having a law like this and putting things under this and also another very fundamental problem i have is why the government is deciding what is essential what is not essential like if i if let's say the government decides that these are the drugs which should be considered essential like let's say i am a liver patient right i have an issue with my liver for me any drug related to uh my issue is essential something related to heart for is not essential for me so why should the government decide on my behalf that's the thing so instead of making these kind of mechanisms to ensure or at least the intended aim is to ensure availability accessibility to these kind of uh, goods and services the government should find out should ideally go to the roots and find out why you do not have sufficient goods and services here why you do not have sufficient entrepreneurs who are willing to create these goods okay why they are not willing to manufacture these goods and services why they are not willing to supply these goods and services maybe we should be going to the roots and addressing that controlling prices is more about attacking the symptom you are not going to the root of the disease right so i would suggest rather than having a provision like essential commodities act find out the reason why you do not have supply of all these things because at the end of the day if demand is there and supply is not there at that point of time the prices will be high if the supply increases as per the demand the prices will be in control or at least the prices uh, you will get the right kind of price right that makes sense and i think that's a major lesson to be taken from uh, what we seeing around us and uh, i think it's very important to know and observe that if there is something not being manufactured or the prices of something is artificially high there is an entry barrier and more often than not that entry barrier comes from the government in some or the other way and it could be uh, that uh, you need a certain amount of capital to enter a particular industry necessarily or you need like a couple of licenses cleared which are dependent on bureaucrats and a ton of other restrictions In fact, sometimes uh, it's not very easy for us to collaborate with foreign entrepreneurs, right? I mean, getting them set up their subsidiaries in India or having that know-how transfer isn't as easy, and the transaction costs just keep on piling up, which makes sure that a lot of people who can innovate, who can increase the supply and decrease the price, are going to stay out of this market. So, I think overall, this is an important thing to learn. from what we seeing uh, around an essential commodities act could have hurt us if the government had continued to do what it was in the beginning but only when the government let it uh, let itself go when price caps could not come into being and people could innovate freely is when we see that this mark of innovation is coming by so i think sarta there is very little logic in not allowing other industries other products to follow suit yeah exactly so when you say innovation right uh, i i'm really i just want to pitch in here see just look at the kind of innovation that we have seen not only in mask and look at uh, the sanitizer market as well right uh, i mean typically we used to get those bottles right 100 ml 50 ml bottles of sanitizers uh, nowadays you have sachets right uh, the sachet of sanitizer so if you are ordering food from somewhere they ca- they deliver the food to you along with that sachet apart from that all these uh, sanitizer dis- dispenser using foot those kind of things have come up a uh, couple of days back i was just scrolling through my through my insta feed i saw an advertisement for a wristband kind of thing which has a small uh, tiny uh, bottle for uh, dispensing sanitizer so again there has been massive innovation in the last uh, last few months when it comes to sanitizers or the way you dispense sanitizers as well as masks absolutely and uh, my immediate uh, reaction towards uh, hearing sachets and uh, hand sanitizers is how useful it would be for that person who is not able to buy the whole bottle right sometimes uh, uh, you're in a situation yeah. where all you need is one sachet and you know that you're safe for like about a few more interactions to come and the sky is the limit right today we seeing wristbands we seeing uh, fantastic sprays and i can't even yes. uh, contemplate what it could be next time when it's working on already so i think uh, one interesting thing that i learned about was that you're going to use drones to sanitize places so if you were in a big marketplace and they uh, felt like oh like say a shopping complex right and uh, you want to get the whole floor sanitized you just let it drone out with uh, enough sprays and it's doing the task for you so 
this is just uh, just fascinating how markets can respond to things and how we need to trust them a little more to see magical things appear in front of us exactly so i mean if you look at the entire spectrum right where the government gets involved where the government doesn't get involved like uh, so there is an entire spectrum in so, so on, on one side you have government not doing anything on the other side government doing everything on its own so if you look at this entire sectors in the last few months initially the government is trying to intervene but over a period of time the government has uh, somehow moved out of it so government is not doing things on its own it is not the one which is which is manufacturing sanitizers or which is manufacturing uh, masks it has changed certain incentives though uh, for example licensing requirements and all these things have been changed it it has become much more easier to manufacture these things so uh, in this entire spectrum uh, on one side where government doesn't do anything on the other side government do, is doing everything somewhere in the middle that was the role of the government rest was left to the markets the markets innovated they came up with different kind of products and now we have uh, i mean it is meeting the demand and we also have surplus production uh, for both masks and sanitizers right so i think coming forward uh, the government needs to learn a lot from this because uh, there will be big uh, problems to solve right including how vaccination will work how we'll supply uh, vaccination who will get it how we we'll prioritize people and i have a feeling that prices are the most underrated phenomena in any society and governments tend to underrate them more than any other organization or institution so it'll be interesting how we uh, to see if we learn any lessons here and to see how things progress from here on so this is it for uh, from sarthak and i this week and uh, hope to catch you on another episode of all things policy stay safe and have a fun new year thank you thank you please consider signing up for takshashila's courses applications are now open and you can apply at www dot takshashila dot org dot in slash courses. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, IVM podcast dot com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey. If you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website takshashila.org.in. I hope you enjoyed that show. If you aren't following us on social media, it's 2021 now. It's time you did. You didn't in 2020. That was bad enough. But now in 2021, you really, really should. It's IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And a quick reminder to everybody, just please help us out with our survey, ivmpodcast.com slash survey. We've had a number of you fill it out so far, but we want to shatter last year's number, right? Really, really blow that up. Go fill out the survey over there. If you do, we'll select from the emails that we have got submitted and we'll be sending out some interesting track to people. So what should you be listening to this week? First thing I want to talk about is the unprecedented episode. We did a triple crossover. Vineet Kanobar from Storytellers and Storytellers, Varun Dugirala from Advertising is Dead, and Karthik Nagarajan from the Filter Coffee podcast all got together and put together a mega episode. Do check it out on whichever of their feeds you want. It's available on all three. On Naan Curry, the guy spoke about the history of alcohol in India. It's got a longer history than people would think. Definitely do check it out. Another show I want to call out this week a little bit is The Note by Maruk Inayat. Maruk had two fantastic episodes this week. She did her first episode with Amitabh Mathu about the elections in Kashmir and then she did another one where she told the story of how she faked her identity to interview Benazir Bhutto. Definitely do check it out. And with that I hope to see you again next week. What are some of the radical changes that are now shaping our workspace? With physical distancing and heightened safety protocols being the norm, will technology finally make its large scale entry to the workspace? Will design as we know it change for the long term? Is it possible for the Indian commercial real estate space to adopt a 360 degree approach to sustainability? Join our hosts at the Future of Space podcast by RMZ as we deliberate with industry leaders, analysts and bright young minds on the way forward for the workspace given the new covid normal. Tune in to the IVM Podcasts app or wherever you stream your favorite podcasts 